Hi, everyone. Welcome to this virtual village of women gathered here from all parts of the world to share their stories of birth and transition into motherhood as a means to empower each other through storytelling. I'm Bibi Lorenzetti, and I am so honored to be here today with Debra Pascali Bonaro. She is, she wears many hats within the birth community, uh, but the things that stand out the most um, is she is the filmmaker and the person behind Orgasmic Birth. Um, she is a, Do a Donna Doula teacher trainer, uh, childbirth educator, and she does all kinds of things to make childbirth uh, a good place and safe place for mothers across the world. So I'm gonna let you best introduce yourself. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us today, Debra. Thank you so much, Bibi. It's such an honor to be here with you. And thank you for that intro because <laughs> it has it is many hats. And so I'm honored that really as we're here to talk about, you know, birth, it is my own birth journey and birth stories that brought me to do so many different things in the birth world. Um, so it's really an honor to hear about your project and be a part of it. Thank you. Um, so let's begin, let's dive in by you telling us a little bit about where you're from, where you were originally born, and then where you ended up being, if different, when you gave birth. Yeah, so I was born in Ridgewood, New Jersey at Valley Hospital, and I live in Rivervale, New Jersey, literally a couple miles from where I was born. And I come from this big Italian family and our roots are really right here. So I've been here almost all my life, except for when I went to university. And actually my first son was born in Canada because I was up in Montreal as a student married there and had my first son in Montreal. That's nice that he has a Canadian citizenship as well. <laughs> yes. Um, so I vividly remember from um, the Dona teacher training your beautiful story, and I'm that's why I'm so excited that everybody gets to hear it. Um, but I love that you know knowing all the places where you've been in between that. It's so wonderful to hear that you're back, like you're, you're living like so close to your origin. It's really nice. Um, so let's travel back in time to that time in Quebec where you were studying and became pregnant. Was it a plan? Was it a surprise? How did you prepare if you did at all, either before or once you found out? Give us a little bit of yeah. that story. So as a student, it was a surprise pregnancy. It was not planned. Um, thankfully, we were very deep in a relationship and already considering getting married. So it was, you know, the baby coming early kind of pushed that along. But when I found out that I was pregnant, it wasn't like the beginning of my fascination with birth. I had been really blessed coming from this big Italian family that I had a grandmother, a great grandmother and many aunties as I was growing up. And as a little girl, I loved birth stories. Like it was kind of like, it makes me think I was born into this world with this passion for birth. So I really listened to a lot of birth stories when I was very young. And my great grandmother, you know, blessed to know her in her late 80s when I was a very young girl, she gave birth to eight children at home. And some of them coming over from Italy were born literally in Little Italy in New York on Mulberry Street, some in Brooklyn, um, and some the later ones they moved to New Jersey where we are and in the early 1900s northern New Jersey was farmlands so this was the country they were farmers and she always talked about moving. And, you know, when you're little, you don't envision your great grandmother at 19, 20, 25. All I could envision is this old lady who was short and round and kind of slow and waddly. She would often when tell her story and she would show me, she would get up and kind of waddle over to the sink and lean over the sink and show me how she would birth and the midwife 
or the doctor. And in some cases, my grandmother, the oldest daughter, would catch the baby, hand it back up to her. And now envision this like late 80 year old round woman actually acting out her labor and birth to me, this little girl, and she would take this imaginary baby up into her arms and just have such joy and love and ecstasy um, that like, she never talked about fear. She never talked about pain. She talked about hard work. It was challenging, you keep moving. So the stories in my family were people that birthed in their way, right? They were surrounded by family, by other women and people that knew how to provide comfort. And then if my grandmother could catch one of the babies, I thought, how big a deal could birth be? So when you fast forward to me now pregnant in Canada, I wanted what they had. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to go find a midwife and I'm going to have a home birth and I'm going to, you know, lean over the kitchen sink. And That's so awesome. as I started learning, Canada had lost their midwives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't realize that this had also happened in the United States. Like I started getting a history lesson of how um, we had lost midwifery, we had moved birth from home to the hospital, and I knew some of that because I was the first baby in my entire family born in the hospital, and I remember I was really sad about that as a little girl. I was like, didn't understand why everybody else was born at home and I wasn't. So I started digging deeper into these layers and literally found out in Quebec at, in 1981, midwifery was illegal. And the midwives that were underground were at threat of going to jail if they attended me. And they wanted to support me, but they felt that they couldn't. So I had to go on a quest and I started interviewing physicians and many of them were not quite happy. Like I wasn't going to lay down and spread my legs till we talked about what this paradigm of birth would be like. And I felt honored and respected. And so I walked out of a fair number of offices. I was like, I'm not hiring you. And that blew them away because they weren't thinking of this as a hiring process. But for me, it was. I wanted what I knew was possible. And it led me to finally find a young resident. I literally was getting nice and round and pregnant and didn't have anyone I felt safe with yet. They were telling me things like, you know, trust us, just show up and we'll take care of you. And I thought that doesn't feel very honoring. You know, I want to know that you'll allow me to move and birth upright. And they were th saying things like, you know, just get the epidural, like don't be a martyr and then we'll handle everything. And I thought, well, I'm glad to know it's there if I want it, but that's not my intention right now. So there were just all these disconnects and I was really struggling. So being a student at McGill, I had this bright idea. What if I went to the medical school and yelled out in the cafeteria one day at lunchtime, is there anybody who hasn't seen a birth yet? Because I wanted someone who wasn't yet indoctrinated into a broken model. And so many students laughed at me, you know, the crazy woman, you mean you want someone who's got experience? And I was like, no, 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 you're being indoctrinated into a dysfunctional model. And I want someone that's going to be open to learn with me. And luckily, this wonderful doctor came forward, his preceptor agreed, and we had some great prenatals where I could explain my family's stories, I could ask him to to read two books that were the two books I found really helpful and for all of you today you have to think back in 1981 the bookshelf about birth was kind of like this big you know there might have been eight or ten books to choose from it's not like today I almost feel for you there are just so many choices right it can be overwhelming of what to read but the two books that almost fell off the shelf at me were Immaculate Deception by Suzanne Arms and Spiritual Midwifery by Ina Mae Gaskin. And I 
gave them to my doctor now and said, I want you to read my perspective. I'll tell you my stories and I want to help you learn. You know, I know you're new and learning all about pregnant people's bodies and how to check. And we can do that with respect and I'm happy to guide you. So we developed a really good understanding and relationship. And he really heard me. He listened to what I wanted and kind of gave voice that that's a little different than the system, you know, but let me get permission. And we kept talking and a, a big one at the time was to birth upright. Like everybody was on their back, right? And I said, Tim, this is crazy. Like if my little old 90 year old grandmother could waddle to the sink and give birth upright, why would you put me on my back when the biggest thing ever is coming out of my body and I want to use gravity? So that took a lot of permission. And at that time, episiotomy was routine. And so I said to him one day, I have a deal. If you don't cut me, I won't cut you. That's how I feel like if your body was prepared to stretch and open multiple times a day um, or stretch and grow as a male penis, then I know that my vagina as well was really ready to open and close. And when I said, if you don't cut me, I won't cut you. He was like, whoa, you really got it. So we made all these deals and it was so good. I felt really heard, seen and ready for my birth. And it was a beautiful Saturday morning. The sun was shining, August 1st, 1981. And my water released. And I knew this is the beginning, right? So I was excited and took my time to move and get settled in. And quickly the surges started picking up pretty quick. So we got ready to go to the hospital and I knew that I would be safe with my doctor there to really support me. But when I got there, they let me know that he was across town in another hospital in Montreal. And the nurse said to me, sorry, honey, without him here, I don't care what your agreements are. Like we're going to do typical care, get in bed, and we're going to plug you into that IV, which we had talked about not, not having. And they had policies back then that once you were in bed, you didn't even get up at all. They'd give you a bedpan. And I was like, hell no. So I said, well, since you're going to like tie me up literally to this bed, I'm going to go to the toilet first. And they said, it's a good idea. And I went in there and I'm so lucky there was a lock on the door and I locked the door and yelled, there's two ways I'm coming out. One, if I, my baby's born or two, my doctor arrives Wow! because I didn't feel safe to let strangers who weren't going to honor and respect me, take care of me. And all of and, this while you were in labor. Because <laughs> I'm like, imagine, I'm like, wait, she's also in labor while she's doing this. <laughs> totally. But, you know, in labor, and I've learned later on, right, that the key things that people need for labor to go gently and easily is to feel safe is number one. And I didn't feel safe out there with all those people. Privacy is number two. So that bathroom gave me privacy, gave me safety. And you don't want to feel observed, right? You don't want to be a lot of strangers looking at you. So without knowing the science, I knew in my body that that was my safe, private, unobserved place, and it had a sink. And for me, that's all I needed. I leaned over on that sink, and I just, my great-grandmother had passed just a few years before, but she was so present with me at this point. I really felt her love and her wisdom surrounding me. And my grandmother and my mother, who I was so close to, were back in New Jersey, so 300 miles away. But I still called on their energy and their wisdom. So for me, in my mind, I had this circle of women, the women of my family that had all given birth and knew how to do it. And they had convinced me that 
I knew how to do it. So labor started going very quickly. They I were pounding pause because I feel like it's so empowering to hear you say that even though you had so little, um, because I feel like it points to how important it is to have an inward journey because you were in a bathroom essentially. And yet you didn't have the candles, the essential oil, the birth ball, but yet you were able to, to, because you were by yourself, you were able to turn that into a positive situation instead of being like, well, now I'm in the bathroom and it's stinky, what, you know, and you were able to be inward, you know, and I think that's such a great reminder because I feel like in the world of today, we're so used to so many comfort things. And sometimes we make as women the mistake of putting all of our um, hopes into like these little external things when it's so nice to hear that you just had a bathroom and that was enough because that was your privacy and that was the way that you were going to be able to be on a sink and connect to all the things that you needed to connect with so it's so refreshing to hear that I think we have to really embody that a lot more in today's society where we have access to so much it's it's hard, it's sometimes hard to remember like the essential is inside of us so thank you for sharing that. I love that. The bathroom was all and you needed. <laughs> all I needed. And thank you for pointing that out because I couldn't agree with you more, right? That labor is a deeply inward journey. And it's really important, right? That we prepare in that way. And that, you know, we're going to have moments where fears come up or other thoughts come up or it brings us outward, but being prepared, how do you clear them away and connect back? Like for me, I was clear when they were going to hook me up to those machines, which would have been that outward journey. Right. I had to quickly find a place to literally disconnect from all of that. Right. I love that. <laughs> so I'm in there and they pound on the door and they're telling me they're going to call psychiatric, like the crazy lady locked in the bathroom because they're saying to me, I'm putting my baby at risk. Like so often we do this, we use the system, not we, the system uses fear to get us to agree to their needs. And I was like, no, my baby's okay. I feel my baby moving inside me. I'm more afraid to get in a bed and lay down and have you pump drugs through me, right? So lucky for me, I don't know to this day, like how long it was. Cause when you're in labor, you kind of lose track of time. You're in that liminal space when you're on that inward journey, but it wasn't that long. There was a knock on the door and I heard my doctor's voice and uh, I quickly unlocked the door and kind of came out and he said, Oh, Deborah, how did I know when they told me there's a woman locked in a bathroom and labor and delivery, it would be you. And he was so amazing because at that moment, my labor really took off because now I had everything I needed to safely give birth. And so I just really let go and that allowed me to open. And now I got scared. And I remember that moment of like doubt. And as a doula, I see it so often that we all have that moment of doubt. And he was like my doula. When we have that moment of doubt, we need to look into the eyes of someone that trusts us and trusts birth. And I just remember him just saying, you got this. You're doing it. You can do it. And that like just what a gift he gave me at that moment instead of going you know what you're right you're never going to do this or let's get you some meds or something which is again another saying of we don't think you can do it he stood strong with me and that really got me through that last hard part of labor that scare that I had he brought me back to confidence that I could do this and I got fully open and back in those days, we had a labor room and then a delivery room. So even though I was fully dilated, I still had to go to the delivery room, which looked like an OR back then. And it was literally this like metal table, like an operating table. And there were stirrups and everybody gave birth back then on their back legs in the air. I mean, we still do too much of this today. We often get rid of the stirrups, but we replace it with a person holding your foot up in the air. 
but we had practiced. I was birthed and upright like my great grandma and my grandma. So I got up and all these students wanted to come in and see the woman who was gonna birth like a monkey. And at that point, I let them in. I thought, you know what, let them learn that birth works. And so I'm in a nice squat, holding on to my doctor's shoulders for support. I eased my baby into the world and I told everybody, no yelling four letter words while I push my baby into the room. Because if people are yelling or counting, then you're following their rhythm. And my requirement was absolute silence so that I could listen to my body and still feel my great grandmother helping me to have the confidence to birth. And after my son was born, I was the first intact meaning no episiotomy in that hospital because they cut everybody. And my doctor yelled out, I did an intact delivery. And he had just handed me my baby and I yelled back at him, I did an intact delivery. You caught the baby. Let's get the language right. Because so often the language even takes our power away. And it was a beautiful, empowering birth. Um, I have to say, you know, after having more births, I realized how much I had to stay thinking like I still had, I couldn't fully surrender because the system was like right out here at me. Right. Um, and I learned that, you know, what a gift for people that cannot have all that outside chatter. But I also learned that even with the outside pressure, that I could find a way to still have the birth that I desired. And I am forever grateful for that doctor who we learned together um, that really took the time to want to listen and learn and be open that there was more to birth than what he was getting in a textbook. Yeah, that was probably such a huge learning lesson for all the people in that room that day to see what birth looks like. And I wonder you probably changed a lot of perspectives in that room and caused a lot of doubt. <laughs> What do we do now with this information? <laughs> How do we shut up about it? That's great. Um, just out of curiosity, are you still in touch with that doctor? Because I'm sure he's not forgotten you. I know. And we've lost touch. And I keep thinking I need to try to find him again. We were in touch for a while. And I know he did go on to support home birth midwifery as midwifery made a comeback. Um, he definitely, we changed each other's lives that day. He opened up to a different model of care than maybe he might have otherwise. And it certainly set me on a journey to say, what would have happened if I didn't have my great grandmother and grandmother and mother's stories? What if I had not had the confidence at such a young woman to be able to navigate um, a broken system? And that made me really passionate about helping others to, to have the knowledge, the stories and the wisdom. Absolutely. So I want to go back to that moment of so you have the baby and you're still at the hospital. How long did you have to be there? And how did you, yeah, how did you make your, you know, your space there? And then what was it like to go home with the baby? Because, you know, I and whoever else is watching that's, a, you know, have, has seen other stuff of yours. We kind of feel like, well, of course, you always knew what to do and how to do it. But I'm sure back then you were also, you know, you were a student. You So how I'm really curious to hear, how was it for you to be in that space of not knowing? And yeah, how was the transition into, into motherhood for you? So I have to say the next 24 hours, I did stay at the hospital. Their policy at that time was to stay several days, but 24 hours was kind of it. Um, they also at that time cared for babies in nurseries and I refused to let my son go to the nursery. So I was still having to kind of fight a system 
them that couldn't understand like why I didn't need a break after birth so the baby could go to the nursery and that the baby would get better care there almost. They were insinuating. I was like, no, 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 I'll, I'll take good care of my baby. So I kept my baby with them. And my husband, we were so happy that we were able to have the birth we desired that I sent him out and he got my favorite food. And we had this big celebration dinner because after labor, you're starving, right? All this work that you've done. And I remember the nurses were so like shocked that we were having this big party with our baby in the room. And they kept coming and going, you're stinking up the room because I had a lot of like shrimp and fish and stuff, right? So they were mad at me. Um, but I was so glad to leave and get home. And then that's when it shifted. I got home and I was like, now what? I remember right? that myself. <laughs> I was like, okay. And, you know, I remember my husband at the time, we're like looking at each other like, do you know how to do this? Do you know how to do this? <laughs> like, this, this baby didn't come with directions. Like, we're in a bit of trouble. So I actually called my mother and my grandmother and I honestly hadn't prepared. Like, I was so consumed with how to get the baby into the world, I hadn't thought about these next days and weeks. And I said, can you come up like now, like get in the car, you're six hours away, drive. And thank goodness they did because I was scared. I really felt at that point, I hadn't prepared at all. And I felt at a loss. Um, so I felt really lucky that they came up and my mother and I, and maybe some of you listening relate to this, we have, I love her dearly, she's still here, but we have a challenging relationship too. And instead of adding to making me feel really safe and confident, I felt like she was starting to add to more stress. Like I wasn't getting all what I needed from my mother at that point. And so we, I was clear. I thought I better communicate this. And she left and my grandmother stayed. And my grandmother and I had always such a special relationship that her staying with me for the next two weeks was exactly what I needed. Someone not to judge me, not to give any side comments, but just to kind of love me and support me and help me find my way. And she held that space for me so beautiful, you know, made me food, made me feel like, again, you've got this. Right. I'm here to take care of you and you'll take care of your baby. And she didn't try to direct me. She just supported me. And that to me is a beautiful memory. Um, and now I pass that forward. That's a doula, right? Not having that judgment, that unconditional nurturing and love to let you kind of blossom into parenthood at your pace and in your way. So that really helped. But I do have to say when she left after two weeks, I was like, oh, it was so hard because I really, I really look back now, I, I needed another four weeks of support. Like it was still hard in that postpartum time. And, you know, there were still, there were good moments and I certainly loved my baby, but there were some hard moments and that lack of sleep and trying to do things when you're so tired. Um, it still was a roller coaster of time. I want to, um, I want to dive more into this, but I want to Point, point, pause one second because I feel like what you said about um, the support from your mother being not exactly what you wanted I feel like today whether it's your mother your own mother or Instagram I feel like the women that I work with postpartum it's sometimes and myself included like we're so harsh on ourselves because we constantly either compare ourselves to others and how they might be doing it better or we feel like just because someone posts something like they're doing it this way we feel judged that maybe we're doing it wrong and so I think that that's whether it's our mothers or whether it's social media we're still we struggle with that a lot I think as women and so I'm wondering if you have any um, anything to say to that to whoever is listening to this in terms of like how you might shield yourself or how you might you know um, get support in a way that's healthy 
um, how did you draw your boundaries around that? Because you said that you clearly communicated with your mother. Um, so if you have you, if you don't have anything to say about that, don't worry. But if you have anything that you feel like through the years you've kind of mastered in your own life. <laughs> Yeah. And even in subsequent birth, I changed it up because I knew I would say, you know, all, first of all, as much effort as you put into, you know, birth, and I hope it's a lot, you need to put into preparing for postpartum and really ask yourself those questions. Like I hadn't thought ahead to what my mother's role would be. And I think if I had been clearer ahead of what I needed and talked with her about how her comments or her judgment or even her body language, when we're postpartum, sometimes it's not words, it's the roll of the eyes, you know, it's you want someone there that's just a hundred percent there for you so that you can feel confident and if anybody enters your space and that's true in labor too in labor and postpartum you are so porous and open and vulnerable that you want to make sure you're shielding yourself from anybody that's not going to be supporting and unconditionally loving and nurturing you and that their role is not there to hold the baby they're there not to just visit their role is to care for you and if you're cared for then you'll be able to care for your family so for me i really switched it leader. yeah totally your own cheerleader like second baby and third baby i invited my sister and I just knew like, and I was really clear ahead of time too. I was really clear to her ahead of time what my needs were. I made my list like, these are the things come early, see how the rhythm of my house is. I want, you know, you to watch the other children so I can be with the baby. Like I really made it very clear. And I think the clearer you are as a person, right, of what do you want, the more likely you are to receive it, to just invite people in and leave it up to chance. Yeah. Too often, you're not getting your needs met. Right. Yeah, that's really good. So it, it's like having a, a birth preferences uh, for the postpartum time. Yeah, that's totally. Great. So let's go back to um, you were saying that your postpartum time was, there was definitely that up and down. And I know that for myself and for other women that I've spoken to, um, you know, I had postpartum anger and I wasn't aware of that. I had heard of postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety, but I hadn't really heard of the anger part. Um, and it really, a lot of why I'm doing this now is that I, I wanna hear as many stories for others, you know, to hear and know. Um, so, what your ups and downs was it just a, a general fluctuations of your mood with your hormone as your hormones readjusted or was there something specific that you experienced um it was a mix it was certainly the hormones it was lack of sleep i'm one that loves to sleep and that lack of sleep i found like there was no one that could have prepared me for what that was like. I almost felt like at some points it was torture. I was like, as much as I loved my son, like it's only been two hours and you need me again. Like that was really hard some nights. And, you know, I was breastfeeding exclusively. So there wasn't anything that my husband can do. And he also, um, at those times, you know, we hadn't even considered, you know, the word paternity leave didn't exist. It wasn't a time that he would have taken off. And he was a student too. And he was like going through the throes of like a lot of demands on him, both to be in school and working. So I didn't have you know, a lot of support from him. And when you say anger, I would say my anger was the fact that he couldn't do more, even though my mind knew that he was so busy trying to do his own role to care for us, his lack of physical support there for us. I was angry. I was like, here I am now, my family's 300 miles away. And this is hard. Yeah. Yeah, I feel a lot of women feel that now. And especially with the pandemic, I mean, who knows when people, women will be watching this, but I feel like that's definitely been, and you've probably seen it too, helping other women. It's it's a big issue, the distance and, and the isolation also of just being alone. So um, did you have, were there things that helped you through it? Yeah, I was really lucky. I reached 
at one point I really realized that as a student, my friends didn't have children. So they weren't like the best people to call up at two in the morning and say like, this sucks, right? They were like, what are you doing up? Um, so I decided I needed to find a circle of new mothers. And that was the best thing I ever did. Uh, around when my son was around five weeks old, I was like, I got to find other mothers. And I started going up to people in parks. And if I saw anyone else with children, I was like, are there new mothers groups? Like, I need help. I really started giving voice to that. And I am to this day so grateful that I met someone in a park who connected me to a new mother's circle. And every one of those people still has such a special place in my heart. The next two years, we met, we cried together, we laughed together, we were honest, we were vulnerable, we shared tips on how to do things. And I realized that I wasn't going crazy. Like, all new parents struggle. Like I had this myth that like everybody else is doing well and it's just me. So being in that circle was amazing. And my husband even used to say to me, he'd come home and he'd look at me and he'd go, you were with your circle today. He could tell because even though it might've been a tough day, I could manage when I was part of a village. When it had been too many days without a check-in, he could say, you really need to get to your circle. <laughs> Yeah, it's so powerful to be together with other people that are going through the same thing. And I think that that's the one thing that I love, that I feel like my son has gifted me this opportunity to really connect with other women that I don't think I would have done otherwise in my life. Um, there's like this whole other depth of appreciation for, for women and mothers and grandmothers and all of that. Um, so that's wonderful. And so then you have this child, you grew it up. And then when you went back into the two other births, uh, well, actually, wait, hold on. I want to get to actually the, after the first child, what was it like to, because you were still in school, right? I had just finished school. I literally graduated a few weeks before he was born. Okay. okay. So then what was, how did, how did having a child in the midst of that possibly change the path? that you were on? Well, it really did because um, I began university one going into nursing, but because I, I wanted to be an L and D nurse and get into kind of midwifery and that. But when I first started seeing nursing, I realized I didn't want to be a part of the broken system. And at 19, I tried to change the system. You know, at 19, you have a lot of energy, but I quickly realized that this 19 year old was not going to change a whole entire model. So I switched and I decided, well, if I can't change the model, I'll go into education. And so I got a degree in elementary education and I was loving, even through my pregnancy, I was teaching children, right, as my intern and that, and I loved it. But after birth, I thought, I want to teach adults. I want to really see if I can help more people be educated about their bodies, their births, their babies, their families, and postpartum. So definitely, it set me on a new path. And so why I was home that first year, I was doing a lot of research about how could I work with people around childbirth in a different way. That's great. And did you feel at all lost or because I feel like a lot of us we go into giving birth like so sure that we're going to go back into our lives and you know back into what we were doing and then all of a sudden it's like oh I'm not that person anymore and I feel this really deep calling to do this other thing and so I know that in my own experience it, it was a little there was definitely some friction in accepting you know, to shed that skin and embody this new skin was it for you was it a smooth transition of just like accepting or was there a little friction? No, it was really smooth because I felt so strongly. Um, when I was in that new mother circle and I heard their birth stories and I heard that they had been pressured into things that they didn't want, but that they didn't even know that they had a choice in, that angered me, right? I was like, people don't know what they don't know. And so the more I met new parents and heard stories, I was like, I knew I wanted to get engaged and do something to help people so that they can make the best choice for themselves and their baby. Right. 
That's wonderful. And so then you went on to have a birth number two and a birth number three. And is there anything that, you know, we need another like three hours to thoroughly talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> I just I'll wanted give to you a very quick synopsis because I knew when I was pregnant with my second, I wanted to be closer to my mother and my grandmother. Like I clearly knew as much as I loved Montreal and we had envisioned a life there, I didn't want to be postpartum again without family. So I was lucky my husband agreed and we moved back to New Jersey. Now, I this is again where I made a mistake. I, in Canada, there were no midwives. I just kind of made an assumption that we, I didn't know any midwives around here. I kind of did pre-internet, right? So you have to remember that a quick search, I wasn't finding midwives. So I thought, okay, if I'm gonna to have to go through this whole doctor route again, I'll get a female OB and as a woman, she'll get me. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, she did a great job of acting like she got me all through my prenatals. She yesed me, she listened, but as soon as I got into labor, it was like Jekyll and Hyde, like this person that arrived in my labor room, I didn't know. Wow. And I actually in labor, like, threw her out. And I ended up, even though I was in a hospital, my husband and I had my second son alone with no one in the room. And Good. I would, <laughs> but it was not what I wanted, right? Like it wasn't the warm, gentle birth. It was once again, me having to fight for my body and my rights and my baby at a moment that I should have had exactly what I wanted. It should have been so much gentler. And for me, it's not a great memory. It's a memory I, I'm angry to this day at her that she deprived me, that she fooled me. Why did you yes me? If you had been honest prenatally that that, that wasn't your model, then I could have had an opportunity to find someone else or at least be ready for who you become in labor yeah but to a, yes me yeah. it was horrible and so that birth left me really angry of at myself for not going exploring deeper like trusting someone that then violated that trust um, and I knew that if I had another one I was finding midwives so the good news is after that birth literally within weeks after that birth, I was walking down the street and a woman came up to me. It's almost like you just say like, wow, how did this happen? And said hello, because we were new in the area and she was a midwife. And I was like, oh my goodness. And she was starting a study group and needed some apprentices. And I was like, I'm in. And I joined a midwifery study group and worked with some local midwives and it just that was life-changing so the time baby number three came around i was in a midwifery community i knew what i wanted i wanted and this was the birth that i could be surrounded fully by people that got the model that knew me well that respected me and that was I mean, my third birth, every birth was special, of course, but that was the birth that I just feel like I could totally relax into labor and didn't have to call upon that protective part of my mind to say like, is someone going to come at me? Is someone outside that door? I could just say, no matter what's going to happen, they've got me. And that was joyful. That's what I call my orgasmic birth because I really had the circle that I needed. I love this. I feel like the universe was like, okay, she's worked hard enough. We got to give her this chance because she's like brought it to the universe. So that's, I'm so glad that you had this experience finally after all the other two. And I'm so surprised that, you know, just I'm early in my doula, you know, it's the beginning of my doula career and, and I've been really immersed in, in learning from births and from reading and studying, but I, it's very, I'm in awe of you that you had that part of your brain so active and firing up and yet you were able to open it up to allow your baby to come out into the world because that's just like two completely opposite parts of the self and 
you know, I feel like losing your mind is such a integrated part of birth in a good way, losing your mind. And, and you had to be on alert. And I'm just like, wow, you were able to be on alert and lose your mind, <laughs> like completely release, you know? So that's, that's pretty amazing. And that's good to hear that, you know, that is possible because often women don't yeah I mean you know better than me don't have the chance of having everything perfect and in place so that's really but it's I really think too it's not having fear like I was Mm -hmm. I was not in fear and that's the key thing see I think fear is the elephant in the room if you allow other people to say things and you take on their fear or their words create fear in you then it's very hard to open to birth but I didn't have fear I had such fierce confidence in my ability um, that when people did things that I knew in my heart were wrong like I knew their intention was good I knew that anyone who goes into medicine and it's really important to say like you know I don't believe that that people become obstetricians and give up their nights and weekends or midwives. But I think that when you have a broken model, people are taught in a system that doesn't function well. And so I had this fierce confidence to know that it was broken, not take on their fear and just get them away, whether it was locking in the bathroom or throwing them out of the room. Like I knew that if I could create my safe space and privacy, I could do it. That's so, thank you for clarifying that. That's so, yeah, that's great. Um, So after these two births, what was your, yeah, how was it to juggle two baby, two kid, one kid, one baby, and then two kids, one baby? Um, what, What were, I guess, like just what stands out to you, the memories of how you were in that time and how you integrated all these things? Well, from baby one to baby two was my hardest transition. Mm -hmm. I actually felt that was harder than baby one. And I think that I hear this from a lot of people that I work with that, you know, you think, okay, I got this. I know how to do it. But for me anyway, trying to juggle a toddler and a baby, I found a bit overwhelming. Now, the first six weeks weren't bad because I knew enough to have my sister here. And she hadn't had children, so she was fully available. She could watch the toddler. She could cook. She she could care for me. And we had good, clear communication. So the six weeks went pretty good. It was after that. Like, I thought, okay, I got over those hard six weeks. And then I feel like I nosedive. Once I was on my own, that probably up till about month four, I really struggled with the lack of sleep again, trying to do it all, feeling like, why am I not getting things done? Why can't I was doing more self-judgment in that time and struggling. There were days I didn't even get a shower, you know, and my husband would come home and go like, you're still in pajamas. And I was like, yeah, like I haven't figured this out. (laughs) Yeah. That was hard, really hard. But baby number three, and you would have thought, like most people that knew me and knew what a hard time I had on two, when I became pregnant again, they were like, are you crazy? Baby number three was the breeze, the charm. I, I tell everyone, I think once you can juggle two, you can juggle three, four, five. I have to say baby number three arrived. One, it was my most blissful, joyful birth. I never, ever had to defend anything. I could just feel so supported and loved through pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Again, my sister showed up, but I just, boom. I, baby number three, I don't feel like I ever had a hiccup. That was my most joyful transition and just really enjoyed that next year of the three of them in ways that I couldn't have imagined. You think the way that you birth had a lot to do with that? 
I definitely think it had a part to do with it. I definitely think it had a piece. I also think I was clearer and clearer about my needs, making sure my needs and who was doing what, who was cooking, who was doing laundry, who was doing food. Like I knew I wasn't gonna do that for six weeks. I was really good about saying like, these are my six weeks to really heal and get it, you know, acquainted with the baby and get everyone adjusted. And I need to do that with support. Um, and I really feel for people that either don't have that within their structure or are too far away from that in their structure. Um, that's what doulas are for. But I think the more you create that village for yourself postpartum in whatever way that is, the easier it is. And remember, too, by now I was entrenched in this midwifery community. So not just my mother's circle, which I did have. But I had this incredible circle that supported me in that transition in every way. And with good support, it was so much easier. So it sounds like having clear communication is very important. Very important. Whether it's one of the things I tell people prenatally, like, you know, there's one thing to prepare for the birth, but really learning good communication skills, you are, it's going to take you far beyond the birth, communicating with your partner, with your family, right? We all often have a lot to learn in how we can um, enhance our communication with our own village. Yeah. So the last question to you in terms of your story is, um, if there's anything that you would like to share in terms of how your relationship might have morphed through the three births and if there's anything that you feel yeah someone else should know yeah so and this is an important question i'm not married to the father of my three children and i do it you know the great thing about being a grandmother and having grown children in the years of wisdom is you can look back at these things and our relationship really struggled through the children. And I do think part of it is as clear as I was in what I needed, we didn't prioritize our relationship in it. I, we both kind of prioritized the children and we prioritized, he wanted to work harder and harder to make sure that he could provide for the family, but our relationship drifted apart. And I, my latest book, right? Sex After Baby, I wrote because of this, because for me, I envisioned, it was kind of like we got on two different ships and I just assumed, okay, these next couple years, two, three little ones are gonna be challenging. If we don't have much sex, if we don't get those special yummy moments together, it's okay because the children are gonna get bigger and we're gonna come back to the same point. But instead of starting here and ending up here, we started here and we just kept sailing apart. And I look back now and I think, you know, nobody prepared me for that. Nobody helped me understand that you can't put your relationship at, on hold and that sexuality and intimacy is a really important point and communicating your love. What's your love language and how do you communicate it? And even if it's, you know, busy life and you only have a minute, three times a day to connect, to really make that a priority that you take those three minutes throughout the day and hug or talk or say something to each other. And, um, I really look back and say, no one, no one in all the things I did talked about the importance of working on our relationship and talking about sexuality after having a baby. And what would that be like? How would it be different? And what could we do to enhance it? So that was my big takeaway on that. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'm excited to read your book. <laughs> um, it's been on my list it's just my time is shortened <laughs> in life um but yeah absolutely I feel like it is and there's so many different ways of I feel like connect like you're saying the three minutes of connection is intimacy can be can have so many different faces so it's Correct. yeah it's, it's so important Deborah, thank you so much it's been so wonderful I want to you've given so many tips but is there just one more thing you'd like to say, whether it's a word or a phrase or just something that 
you feel should be in our hearts going into this? I would say to every person that's preparing for birth that you deserve to give birth your way. And birth is joyful, pleasurable, loving, challenging, beautiful, difficult, and knowing and preparing and surround yourself with positive stories. Remember my great grandmother, without her story, I don't know where my births would have taken me. So don't underestimate the power of stories and a village. Thank you for that. Um, so if whoever's listening wants to connect with you, I'm going to write it in the commentary of the YouTube uh, channel, but how would they best find you to reach out to you? You'll find me easily. Go to Instagram on Orgasmic Birth. We're always sharing stories there or our website, orgasmicbirth.com. And you can find my books and my classes and all different ways to join me there as well. Okay. Deborah, I'm so grateful to have you on here. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Bibi. It's been such a joy. Thank you. Bye. Bye.